Okay, good morning everyone and welcome um, to our latest webinar. So we are Boston uh, in conjunction with Supermicro. Today we will be speaking specifically about a uh, NVIDIA Supermicro liquid called AI uh, Workstation. Um, just to note for everyone, we will be recording this session um, as well as um, uploading to YouTube following um, the completion of the webinar. So if you miss it, you can uh, review and send out, uh, repost, etc., etc. So thank you very much, and we will start. So Boston, um, we have been in business now for over 30 years. Um, we, I would say, specialize in first to market technologies, so early adopted technologies that may be used for a variety of applications in the server infrastructure space. Um, we pride ourselves on releasing best of breed open source technologies, um, as well as cost effective solutions to maximize business potential. We are accredited, so ISO accredited 9001, 14001, um, predominantly known as a Supermicro global partner, and that relationship um, started in the early 1990s, so well over 30 years. We are a channel-based organization, uh, so we work with a, a worldwide network of reseller um, and vendor partners. We have offices globally also that I will touch on uh, in, the, in the next slide. So here are our locations. We are headquartered in the United Kingdom, so just north of London. We have offices uh, also in Munich, Germany, um, the US, Switzerland, um, Austria, France, and also South Africa on the uh, on the African continent, of course. In terms of Asia, we have uh, several offices in India, including Mumbai, Bangalore, New Delhi, um, as well as having a facility access in Taiwan. And then uh, also uh, within the Australia, Australasia region as well with, with Sydney, Australia. In terms of Boston's value adds, um, so we um, offer um, fast, reliable um, excellence in terms of server um, products, but also customer services. Um, in terms of platform, we offer custom configurations. Um, so anything down to BIOS level, um, all the way through to specific hardware designs. Um, and this includes integration and installation services, so um, specific settings, software installations, anything that can be um, written into a scope we will, will cover. We offer uh, pre and post sales support, so consulting on um, infrastructure requirements, um, and that can be from very specific needs uh, through all the way through to needing a solution to a problem or to provide a solution to um, to run an application use case. In terms of um, how we do this, we would evaluate the business needs, we would consult, we would assess what infrastructure is required to, um, to fix an issue or, or run a particular application set, and we would ultimately design a solution um, based around that. Also, we are able to um, consult on managing that infrastructure. So whether it be via a simple remote management structure or whether it be down to a full managed service on behalf of our partners and customers for that infrastructure. We have a global uh, stocking mechanism. So we will hold stock um, in order to ship very quickly on behalf of our partners and customers, um, as well as a, a very key part of our value proposition, which is our uh, labs um, demo and evaluation center. So within the labs, we have 
um, anything between 500,000 to over a million dollars worth of lab equipment at any one time. And the purpose of this is to offer it to partners and customers for testing evaluation. Um, perhaps there is an application that needs to be tested in advance of purchase or a specific hardware bill of materials that needs to be validated. We will offer that um, via secure link where uh, required. Finally, um, we have a, um, a training academy where we will consult and offer training services on a variety of, of uh, use cases. Very specifically, in, um, we have a, a very wide array of artificial intelligence um, training services. So we will train from the fundamentals, so let's say of deep learning or other types of AI applications or areas, um, all the way through to a very granular in-depth um, training structure for more specific purposes or use cases. So this is uh, a, a section of our solution portfolio. So we work with anything from, let's say, um, non-rack mount solutions, so fanless uh, and non-fanless mini PCs, workstations, 19 and 21 inch rack mount um, compute servers, and that can be uh, CPU compute servers, GPU compute servers, very dense uh, blade servers with integrated switching, uh, as well as storage, so top loading storage, front loading storage, very, very dense, or let's say a, a wide range of product depending on use case and need. And then um, network connectivity, um, so top of rack um, mainly, but high bandwidth and um, let's say Ethernet and InfiniBand connectivity, we will will be able to operate, integrate and um, run a solution stack end to end. In terms of uh, alternative cooling technologies, we are able to offer anything from direct to chip cooling uh, through to immersed cooling as well. We have a variety of solutions that cater for various use cases and applications, so we can cover that area. And then uh, also we have, I would say, embedded on the edge products. So anything from uh, edge devices that might suit the IoT space or uh, 5G embedded IP65 um, mast solutions, we, we are able to cater to, to that uh, segment also. <laughs> So today we have uh, various speakers that will be explaining uh, the specific product and use case. Uh, we have Adam Lister uh, from Supermicro. We have uh, one of our HPC lead engineers in the DAC region, Constantine, uh, and myself, Sam Watto, uh, who will be the moderator. I uh, manage the sales team for the, uh, the UK. So now, handing over to Adam at Supermicro. Thank you, sir. Everyone can see my screen now. I will start. Um, yes, thank you, sir. My name is Adam Lister. I'm a member of the EMEA FAE team here at Supermicro. And today I'll be talking to you about our liquid cooled AI Anywhere workstation. Now, as Supermicro, we've evolved greatly in the last five years. We've, we've transitioned away from being a component supplier towards a complete solution provider. And as part of that, we now provide industry leading research and development and engineering that which directly translates to the broadest portfolio for almost any workload in uh, the industry. That reduces the uh, end customer time to market and it means we're in control of all components within our internal hardware design teams. 
This gives us a very large resource pool to resolve any issues in a matter of days or hours, all with our own in-house uh, facilities. As uh, Sam also mentioned, we are part of a global reach as well. We have multiple sites in the US, Europe and Asia that are strategically placed and we, we trust and rely heavily in our vendor partnerships with the likes of Intel, Nvidia and AMD. Talking specifically about the workstation market, we see that it's growing with a compound annual growth rate of about 11% and will do that for the next eight or so years. And this is a direct result of the needs of digital content, content creation and generative AI. Often there's a huge requirement for workstation performance with limited availability of customization within traditional workstation vendors who provide fairly fixed bills of materials. And that's where we like to differentiate ourselves. And as a result of our growth, our evolution, and the development of our rack scale liquid cooling solutions, and of course the market requirements changing for workstations, we have released this, which is our 751 GE liquid cooled platform. And this delivers a dual socket Intel fourth gen Xeon Sapphire Rapids processors. It delivers four NVIDIA A100 PCIe GPUs. 16 memory DIMM slots, eight hot swap NVMe drive bays, a couple of M.2 slots, 10 gig on board, and two 2200 watt power supplies. And we deliver all of this with our bespoke closed loop liquid cooling to provide class leading cooling to not just the CPU and the GPU, but also other components that we'll detail shortly. We're extremely proud of this unit and uh, we'll go into more detail in the next few slides. But don't just take our word for it. The 751GE recently won the NAB Show Product of the Year 2023, something we're also incredibly, incredibly proud of. So why liquid cooling? And why do we need it within a tower workstation? First of all, there's performance. A reduction of thermal events and a reduction in thermal throttling increases both your CPU and your GPU performance. It not only gives you more performance, but it gives you more predictable performance because you can rely on the, uh, the constant performance of those devices. It also gives you lower operational expenditure due to the thermal efficiency of the liquid cooling and that liquid is more dense than a gas in general, so the thermal conductivity is much improved. It also offers you increased density with higher GPU quantities per node, and you can move the entire, the entire array away from the data center into the workspace, giving you back more space within the DC. As mentioned, liquid has up to 1000x better cooling capacity and it has 25x better heat transfer than air. It also requires 10x less energy to transfer heat away than air, and this all contributes to the lower TCO and improved ROI for you or your end customers. The financial benefits only tell part of the story, however. A traditional air-cooled workstation configured with two high TDP Intel CPUs and four A100 GPUs would emit in excess of 70 decibels when at 100% load. This would be sustainable in a factory environment, perhaps, but hardly conducive to a quiet, productive office environment and such. Our 751GE with closed-loop liquid cooling with the same Intel CPUs, quad A100 GPUs, emits less than 50 decibels at that same 100% load. Whilst 20 decibels might not sound like a lot, a 10 decibel increase equates to roughly 10 times the intensity, the intensity of the noise level. 50 decibels is roughly a quarter that of 70 decibels, for example. This can be extremely beneficial if you require a lot of horsepower or PS for our European colleagues uh, at the desk side. 
where the 751 GE can provide all of the performance with none of the associated drawbacks of noise pollution. <clears throat> we achieve all of this by developing our own in-house liquid cooling loop. Now, traditional liquid cooled setups that you might find in gaming rigs or other closed loop solutions have a much lower amount of liquid and only one single pump. To us at Supermicro, this re represents a risk in terms of evaporation and the quantity of liquid, and it gives you a single point of failure in the solitary pump. And thus, our system features a much lar larger reservoir of liquid and redundant pumps that you can see in the picture that feed a manifold of dry brake connections that are practically leak free and, and feed liquid to each of the liquid cool components. The liquid cool components that we are actively cooling with this liquid within this system are the processors, the graphics cards, the memory modules and the VRMs with our non-conducive liquid. We provision the systems with enough of this PG25 liquid to last the lifetime or the productive lifetime of the system. And also you can see in the top left of the slide that we also give a liquid level view window to enable a very quick assessment of the amount of liquid within the system without having to pull the sides off. <clears throat> Seen from the reverse side of the system here behind the motherboard, you can see the hot and cold flows represented by the red and blue arrows with the large radiator sat in front of the chassis for conventional front to back air cooling of the tower uh, container itself and the devices that aren't covered by the cold plate liquid cooling. Seen from the other side, the motherboard side, we see that we house redundant 4700 uh, RPM fans to provide cooling to peripherals and ensure that there is airflow around the system and it's not just sat, uh, stagnant. Uh, the device here does not show the cold plate liquid cooling on the DIMMs or VRMs, but we'll detail that in the, in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> Up close, here we show the liquid cooling plates on both the CPUs, the DIMMs and the VRMs. Now the CPUs are not cooled in series as they are in other liquid cooled solutions. They are cooled in parallel, which means that you have two equal temperature CPUs. You don't have one that is feeding warm liquid to the other and closing the loop that way. We can also see here that the liquid Cooling is also applied to the memory modules with the plates between each DIM. Another close up showing the connection at the VRM side, the voltage regulator side of the memory DIMMs. From the front, it's a fairly ordinary looking, albeit fairly large tower workstation with eight hot swap NVMe bays, standard USB and audio connections. So it can be interacted with as a, as a normal workstation at the desk side. <clears throat> We're also working on uh, SAS3 and AOC to provide RAID for those NVMe devices, a uh, hardware RAID, sorry. And on the rear, we have a close up of the liquid level indicator that I mentioned, and then we have the coolant fill in and drain out should there be an event that requires a top up. And we also see on the right hand side that we have redundant PSUs, uh, each of those providing over 2000 watts. <clears throat> now, the liquid cooling within this 751GE is closed loop, meaning there are no external connections required as there are in our larger rack scale liquid cooling solutions. There's just under one liter of non-conducive, non-corrosive and non-toxic liquid within the system, and it's a PG25 liquid. The cooling loop is over-specified to be able to provide up to 2.6 kilowatts of cooling capacity 
uh, so it's over specified for CPU and GPU. And this is delivered with a 15% lower than typical power consumption of an equivalent air cooled system. And as I mentioned, the, com the components include the memory, the GPUs, the processors, and the VRMs that provide the CPUs with power that they call for. Uh, not only can this stand upright under the desk side, we also provide a rack mount kit for this. So being on its side and inside the rack, there's no, uh, there's nothing needed to be done to the liquid cooling. It can sustain being both uh, landscape and portrait, if you were. And as I mentioned, there's no external water source required. So this can just be fit in any standard rack. From an application perspective and use cases, I mean, it, it's vast. Uh, it includes natural language processing, autonomous vehicles, and the subsequent data processing and training required. Uh, anything that requires training from scratch and the high compute resource associated with that. It can be very applicable to VDI and uh, deep reinforcement learning. And of course, plentiful use cases within financial services. Uh, and here's a pretty color wheel of where this system, simply by applying the hardware, can accelerate your generative AI workloads, whether that's text, video, image, code, or the myriad of other uh, generative AI applications that we're being flooded with at, uh, at the moment. The target customers for this would be within uh, science and deep learning. Uh, architecture studios, for example, can render on this unit overnight and then chop it up with uh, hardware partitioning to provide VDI for power users and the desktops required in that space, giving you utilization of this system on a 24 by 7 pattern rather than uh, 9 by 5. Uh, oil and gas and the associated research that goes into that field can use this system where the environmental temperature and humidity might not be what you'd usually find within your traditional data center if it's based on an oil rig or in a, an edge location, for example. Uh, just a couple of uh, use cases to finish with. Uh, we can deploy this as a standalone, uh, standalone server running Windows for stable diffusion. And it can be a single instance with this as it features standard Intel Xeon CPUs, configurable memory, configurable storage, and uh, dual 10 gig on, uh, on board. It could also be uh, a small cluster of VMs providing Windows Workstation or Linux operating systems with burst capacity or deploying in a cluster in a, in a remote data center. And finally, as a core cluster, providing a multitude of OS images to many end users, utilizing the power of the workstation for those larger organizations. And uh, that's me. If you have any questions, please ask in the chat or, uh, or follow up later in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. I'll pass on to uh, Constantine. So, uh, warm welcome also from me. Um, I lead AI and HPC solutions architecture for Boston and Dark region. And I will talk a bit more generally about NVIDIA hardware and the ecosystem that NVIDIA provides to help you excel at your AI workloads and AI products. So, the, the first uh, slide is the NVIDIA DGX H100. Probably we've all heard of this. This is the, the go-to building block for AI server workloads. We have eight of the most powerful GPUs in the world in one node, and they are connected with four NVIDIA NVLink switches to each other. This provides an enormous bandwidth from GPU to GPU, up to 900 gigabytes per second, which then helps you to 
um, interleave your communication and help you to excel at the multi-G computations that are so important in deep learning training, but also in deep learning inference nowadays. And to scale out to multiple VGXs, we have 10 NVIDIA Connect X7 400 gigabits per port um, yeah, networking adapters. And this enables you to scale up to like a, a part of 32 DGX of the ease. So there's reference architectures from NVIDIA, Boston themselves as a long-standing DGX partner, and NVIDIA lead partner will, will help you to excel at your large-scale AI journey as well. Two very powerful CPUs and some local uh, flash memory. The, the great thing about this offering is that you don't have to worry about anything. So you will order the system from us and then we will come and install it on site. And afterwards you will have a um, very, let's say, comprehensive support contracts through Boston and NVIDIA. Uh, a recent invent, like a recent product that's like now in the launch phase is the NVIDIA Grace CPU. So this will be NVIDIA's first CPU and it will be based on the ARM architecture. Uh, on the left side, you will see a design which combines two of these CPUs on, on one board. And together with these 144 ARM cores, you'll also get a terabyte of LP, <laughs> LPDDR5 memory. So what does, what does that mean? You have about a terabyte of bandwidth and one terabyte of total memory on chip. Oh, no, not sorry, not on chip, very close to chip. And also between these two, you have uh, insanely fast bandwidth. And then there's also the option to combine one H100 chip and one ARM CPU. And this will give you the advantage to have some of your workloads that run very good on the CPU, on the CPU and then only offload parts of your communication to the GPU while having um, a cache current interface of 900 gigabytes per second. And uh, yeah, so you basically have one H100 with access to 600 gigabytes of memory and the capability to do very, very fast CPU processing. And this chip is available today, is I mean, available, audible today, delivery, maybe this year, only next year from Supermicro in a chassis provided by Boss. So why why do we do this? So why does NVIDIA say, hey, you need the Grace Hopper Super Chip? What are the advantages? And I think the, the best thing is always is to look at the numbers. So these of you that are familiar with HPC probably know that the Gromex benchmark. And if we look at the second graphic, we see that for Gromex, the advantage is substantial. So we, we go up by a factor of over 1.5, close to 1.6, over just using x86 CPU. So this is the performance per watt, which increases substantially. And if you look at the, the raw performance, you see basically also that the, the raw performance also increases substantially. And for a CPU2K, it's even more substantial. And we expect that with the adaption of algorithms, we will even see yeah, a greater edge. And um, yeah, it's great times. So what is what do we see over here? We see um, there's different um, workloads. On the left side, we have HPC. In the center, we have AI inference, which becomes more and more important as more of these large language models move from an R&D project in a company to a productive setting. So people are start implementing chatbots. And once you start implementing chatbots, suddenly, uh, suddenly you have to worry about what is my um, latency on the inference, because users don't like to wait, but also what is your cost, because like you have to run the chatbot. And on the right side, you will see some benchmarks for AI training. So what is this played? We have the A100 performance, which is still a widely used GPU nowadays. We have the H100, and then we have the H100, the updated version that will come with NVLink networking. So this means that unlike in the DJX that we have nowadays, where we have 
angling between the eight GPUs within the DJX, we will be able to communicate between DJX systems, so between multiple nodes through an angling layer. And this is, um, yeah, this will arrive in next year. And we see the performance increase is sometimes like you don't see any, for, for instance, for climate modeling and genomics, because these computations don't utilize the large network in a way that the NVLink performance is such significant. But for other computations, like for FFTs, you see an enormous increase. And for um, also for the AI training space, you'll see, especially for the larger models, you see the, the increase get even bigger because the the synchronization overhead, these computations gets larger and larger. And as probably you might have seen, like uh, notice 395 volume parameters is considered a large language, a very large language model over here. But in reality, nowadays they get even larger. So we, we get into the trillion parameters. And this is where like at least angular communication will really provide true value. Okay, sorry. Um, now there's a, also a GPU called L40S. This GPU was launched um, during the summer months and it's an upgraded version of the L40. So the L40 GPU was mostly meant for mixed workloads of visual, virtual compute and some AI compute. And the L40S doubles the amount of tensor cores. And as you might have noticed, there is somewhat of a shortage around A100. And this is why NVIDIA said, well, let's introduce the L40S with this double amount of tensor cores. You'll see that the performance for certain AI workloads is comparable or even better than on A100. And yeah, so you have, for instance, time to train on 860 million tokens for a, like a GPT <clears throat> LLM. And also for stable diffusion, you see that L40S even outperforms A100. L40S is available today, so we can ship within, to you within a couple of weeks. And yeah, if you, we would be happy to consult you on which of your workloads you might shift from an A100 or an H100 to an L40S to enable you to get the, yeah, take advantage of the, very, the faster lead times and get you running with your AI workloads. And for, for those of you who are prefer like hard numbers, so L40S, like I said, the upgrade L40 based on NVIDIA Ada Lovelace. And because we have the, we are basing the L40, we don't have any FP64 cores. So if you use A100s nowadays for like a classical HPC workload, like CFD, um, and you need, um, you need these FP64 cores, then sadly we cannot use L40S. But for instance, in FP32, we have a huge advantage. We have a four and a half times more performance. And you also have ray tracing cores, of course. And in the tensor cores, which are the basically the vital part of AI, you see that we, we are on par slash a bit above the A100. The only real downside we really have is that you have less memory and you have less memory bandwidth. But this then depends, of course, on the neural networks. And of course, you can also use multi-GPU training to help you cram your models in multiple L40s. So now I would like to give you um, a short, short um, overview on AI in production. So we all talked about like, you all know about this R&D and it's a great that uh, like you can get AI out there and we started running some AI in the cloud and you have a promising R&D project, but how do you now get your AI into productive setting where you can make it create business value and ensure that it has the, like, has the right uptime so your customers will be satisfied. And the, the answer is, well, NVIDIA provides for you. So you, you have on the lower level, you have these like GPU families, and then you, you have like HGX and DGX platforms, which Boston both resells and provides consulting services on. 
you have the, the, the switch layers, which are known as Mellanox, now it's NVIDIA Networking. And on top of that, NVIDIA has built an extensive library in <clears throat> uh, software suites, which are based, for instance, on CUDA, which is most known, but also on RTX or physics. And with this, now we, we come to this NVIDIA AI, and NVIDIA HPC, and NVIDIA Omniverse, kind of these branches. And these then branch out to the like the frame like application frameworks, which I will elaborate later on a bit more, will would help you really to develop your products very very little coding effort. And that's the whole idea. So it used to be GPU programming used to be in the beginning like people wrote some CUDA code, and then people came about like hey that's right like PyTorch TensorFlow, so you can use Python code which just offloads. Then people said like, hey, stop everyone using their own models. Let's get foundational models and you just retrain. And VIA goes one step further and says, look, if you want to, for instance, do autonomous driving, we have a suite called Auto like Drive of robots. We have ISAC. And this is a software suite with certain functions that will cater to your needs. And then you can just build products on top of it to accelerate this development and the trends to bring AI to the people. So over here we have NVIDIA AI Enterprise, which is the um, NVIDIA software ecosystem. So like I said earlier, one of the biggest problems is how do you get AI into production? And NVIDIA AI Enterprise bundles a lot of these open source frameworks together with some proprietary frameworks, and then NVIDIA offers comprehensive support on this. So if you have a problem, you can contact NVIDIA. Um, and the NVIDIA will do their best to fix this because these are they're the leading company in the world. And this is the, the true value. So you have your, like I said, the, the frameworks and you have your tools, you have your management orchestration and your infrastructure optimization. So NVIDIA Enterprise runs on certified hardware that is provided for Boston, as well as NVIDIA Enterprise also provided for Boston together with our consulting services. And then you can just utilize it and you don't have to worry that much on these DevOps tasks anymore. These DevOps tasks get offloaded to NVIDIA. So this is, shows again the, the complexity of uh, AI workloads. So if you now nowadays you, you Google like, hey, how to get started with AI, you will find something like, Okay, yeah, people who want to have like TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, um, you have some developers who basically give you a long list of what they all need. And then there are someone that said like, you need Kubernetes, and then you send up like, which one? And then you figure out there's like a hundred flavors or so of Kubernetes, and then there are some other people who say like, oh, but we prefer Slurm for, for batch scheduling. And like I said, NVIDIA tries to distill this down, and Boston, of course, is also a part that will help you for consulting services to narrow down a solution that works for you and enables you to get a faster time to time to product launch for your AI products. Now let's uh, go a bit more in depth for the um, these AI frameworks. I have to apologize. I'm not sure why my slide decks don't load as uh, fast today. So on the left side for like speech AI, which is insanely important because our, most of our communication is uh, based either on speech or text. So you need to also transform this. You have Lever for like NLP and general generator AI. You have Nemo, recommender systems that made Amazon great, for instance. They are based on Merlin. Smart cities is a thing that comes up more and more. So we have more and more cameras. How do we connect them? How do we get value out of this data? Healthcare of NVIDIA Clara is, of course, a self-explanatory. This is one of our greatest challenges. So there's many diseases we still have to under, fully understand. And AI can provide huge value in, in drug discovery, as well in data um, being like a data analyzer, for instance, for surgeons or for like radiologists. Robotics, 
um, autonomous vehicles, and of course also telco. For instance, there's case studies where NVIDIA helped um, 5G network companies to find out the optimal installation point for the 5G repeaters, because you only have a limited number of repeaters, because it costs a lot of money, and the question is now, where do you place them in a city? So what NVIDIA did, they simulated the whole city with physical properties, and then they could basically figure out, well, to get the best coverage, place your antennas in these locations. And of course, cyber security in a world that becomes more and more challenging, you know, and more and more conflicts arise, cyber security will play an ongoing important role. And what's quite important as well is that all of this, these frameworks, they run throughout the NVIDIA software stack, uh, sorry, hardware stack. So they run on desktops, they run in data center solutions, they run on the edge, and they run on very large supercomputers. Now we come to one of my, my favorite um, tools, which is NVIDIA Tau. NVIDIA Tau is um, stands for Train Adapt Optimize, and it's a software suite that tailors to fine tuning neural networks. So there's, it's available for computer vision models as well as for large language models, and it all comes in a Docker container. So the idea is you have your own data that you collected, which might not be might be extensive because it's very uh, um, very it's not very difficult. It's very expensive to collect data quite often, and you are limited in the num uh, the amount of data you have. So if you would start to train like a, a big model just with your little data, you would fail. So you have your data, you download the pre-trained model from the NGC, then your data gets through data converter, data converter and data augmentation pipeline. This is all provided by NVIDIA and you can alter most of the settings, but there are very good foundational settings already in place. So you don't have to be an expert in these augmentation and data conversion areas. Then you train with your data and your augmented data, and then you will evaluate. Then you will prune your network to make it smaller to run maybe on like the edge hardware or just make it cheaper to run because it's a small network. And then you retrain, evaluate. If you're satisfied, you move on, export this model and then deploy it probably in the eighth calibration. And if you're not, you can just go back and either use some augmented data or just prune a different way. And this really helps the main experts to access AI knowledge. So quite often people say, I need to have five different AI experts for like to get any product going. And this is just wrong. So to get a product going, you just need a domain expert that is willing to learn certain skills. And then you can just do a PUC. And if you, of course, then want to deploy, you can either deploy directly, or if you, after a couple of months of seeing, hey, this could provide real value to us, so you see that you need to some more experts. It's not a problem. You can always hire more people. They can all work with Tau. Tau also scales quite well. And then uh, you hopefully uh, be an AI first company in the near future. And um, so here on the, the left side, you see again a bit more about the, the comprehensive of this. Tau, Tau toolkit here in the, in the middle. On the left side, you see basically how many model architectures you have and how many tasks you can train your models on that. So it's the, the amount of work that NVIDIA has put into this, and you can access most of this for free or quite cheaply, and that's just amazing. So you can basically, NVIDIA says, hey, you bought an NVIDIA GPU, and with this GPU, we offer you a quarter on top of that already. And uh, yeah, so I would suggest use what NVIDIA offers for free and enjoy it and give you get your models in production and then deploy them via DeepStream or Triton and from the edge to the large supercomputers across industry verticals. So uh, another thing like I want to elaborate a bit more because it's quite a quite pressing topic now is NVIDIA Nemo. 
NEMO is for the, the large language models and in general for a generative AI. So NEMO started out with LLMs and nowadays you also have like diffusion models and image to image models. And NEMO runs on the DGX or the NVIDIA the GPU cloud, sorry, the DGX cloud. And it provides the, the easiest way to get into the LLM game. To, it's the, not, the, not the cheapest way, but if you say you want to solve a business case and you want to be fast, then probably NEMO is your best bet. So how does it work? Let's say we, we start with a pre-trained foundational model. Then we first have to, for instance, let's say it's a GPT model. Then we have first to teach you some skills, for instance, like, hey, be a chatbot. And then what you normally do, you would include the main specific knowledge of your company, uh, your field. And then one step that's often overlooked is you exclude everything outside the functional domain. So why is this so important? Let's, let's assume you have a large model and it does its job and then everyone is very happy. You start deploying it and then after three months, someone from the, the business side of the enterprise will come along and say, look, how much do we pay actually to run this model for our customers? And then you look at your cloud bills or you look at your infrastructure needs and you'll see that they explode. And because if we, the larger the models are, the more demanding they are on the computer infrastructure. So it's quite very important that once you deploy a model in production, you limit its size to the necessary size. So it still needs to be a great product, but don't be overly complex so you can save on your infrastructure bills. And then you deploy to an enterprise model, of course, connect to your data sources, and like everything in AI, it's, it's rate of cycle. So if after a certain set of time, you'll figure out, hey, my my customers are less satisfied with the product or there's new data, I should include that. You'll just have to basically retrain the model again. But this, once your pipelines are up, that's just an infrastructure task. It's that much developer time needed anymore. And then you can use, for instance, a model for supply chain forecasting, financial modeling, sales pipelines, legal contracts, or whatever you, you want to do, like customer recommendations. And this, uh, yeah, I would like to conclude my presentation with the base command, which is um, applied showcasing the the power of NVIDIA's ML Ops stack. So you have DGX, like I said, at the bottom layer on the hardware layer. Then NVIDIA started to develop their own OS, which is based on uh, Ubuntu. And then you have the network and storage libraries, which are all controlled by NVIDIA. Then you have cluster management, and then you have the cluster scheduling and AI workflow. So traditionally what would happen if you have a problem with this, you will have to talk to different people. So for the US, yeah, you know, you go to Canonical in South Africa. For the like storage, you go to your storage cars. And for cluster, you maybe have like a, some, you know, contract someone that uh, manages the cluster. But this is just like, at some point, people will just start pointing fingers and we said like, this has to stop. So they all integrated in together into base command. And on top of that, you then stack NVIDIA Enterprise. So you, you all have basically only one person to come to. It's either us or NVIDIA. Oh, sorry, two people then. It's us or NVIDIA, but... Um, and this, of course, helps you to... Um, like make your running your AI more professionally and also to minimize downtime. So once your AI is within your business workflow, of course, you cannot tolerate downtime and it's part of your business critical uh, workflow. And with this, I would like to conclude and hand over back to Sam. Thanks, Constantine. Yeah, so um, ultimately we can answer some questions should anyone have any. Um, so opening the floor to any questions.
uh, just uh, Dan Johnson. I want to say thanks to those who presented, uh, Constantine, uh, Adam, and Sam. Uh, just a quick reminder that everything that uh, you've seen today, so the Liquid Cool 751 GE workstation, uh, the DGX, L40S, and H100 is available for test drive at Boston Labs. So if you're keen to learn more and you're keen to try it out, please don't hesitate to contact us. I have a question actually uh, for Adam, perhaps, uh, I don't know if Adam is able to answer this live, he may have to come back. Is there a, for the uh, Liquid Cool workstation, any possibility to install a video card, an actual graphical output, of course, you know, I know you have your IPMI management, but uh, possibly it'd be nice to have some visualization support. Uh, to, to provide some acceleration for the GUI interface, I presume. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have some customers who they use the compute for perhaps some of the back end ray tracing or some of the AI inference, but the output uh, often is visual and 3D. So having that additional capability is kind of useful. Uh, I believe we support in the slot below the top, below the lower GPUs, uh, some low profile, G some low profile uh, graphical GPUs with graphical output. Uh, I will have to check what is what has been prior has been validated previously. Uh, let's see if I can do that on the fly. Oh, thanks, Adam. Well, if there's any other questions from the floor, please free to type them into the chat. Um, Sam, here are um, coming two questions in. The the first one is, um, how is LQ um, sold separately? And the second question is also, um, which belongs to LQ. For cable Gen 4, Xeon um, sold separately. So um, I think there's a question. This um, goes through um, Supermicro, I guess. <clears throat> uh, Dan, to answer your question first, uh, we have previously supported uh, T400 and T1000. So short depth half height cards in uh, in a single slot oh, great thank you that could be quite useful mm -hmm. <coughs> the uh, other apologies. question what, what, what was the other question for super micro um uh, is lq sold um separately so lq for cable gen 4 xeon sold separately Uh, LQ is in liquid cooling. So I think the, I mean, the, the systems are sold as um, full system builds from Supermicro, but they are customizable, as I understand it. So you can choose the, the type of CPU and memory. I think that's possibly the question that's being asked. Um, okay. There is an yeah, NP1. Well, so I, I didn't um, I didn't understand the, the acronym, but the system is not a fixed bomb. No, it's it's configurable with, as you say, Dan, CPU, memory, and storage in various uh, capacities depending on what you require. 
So we and can then, have so it doesn't necessarily have to have the highest TDP CPU, you know, 300 watts and that. It can have a much lower TDP CPU if you know you're not going to be stressing those too much. I also understand that there's an NV1 SKU, which is the um, NVIDIA AI Enterprise platform, and that includes all of the tool sets and software pre-installed, which uh, NVIDIA offer uh, similarly on the DGX series. So you get the advantage of those uh, ready-to-go containers and access to the uh, NVIDIA GPU cloud. Uh, and that, as uh, Constantine kind of explained, you know, NVIDIA provide all this great software uh, that can really accelerate your your time to delivery of, of your code. You don't need to spend the time downloading and installing quite a lot, finding the right C compilers and the right um, binaries. Uh, it's a really excellent, excellent tool and um, well worth it if it's something that uh, you're planning to use. That's that's right. It's it's very much an alternative to the DGX station that I believe is now uh, is now end of life. Yeah, that's right. We're not able to to procure any more DGX stations in Nvidia. As far as we know, they're not going to make another another revision of it. So uh, yeah, this is an excellent replacement for DGX stations. Okay, and then there's um, coming in another question in. I think this is a question for a, a complete um, webinar topic, which we can um, do maybe the next time. It's um, liquid cooled server technologies versus um, direct to chip cooling. How do you see the um, market? Um, how do you see the technology here? Uh, it's it's growing in a in a big way. Uh, so. As I briefly touched on in, in the presentation, we now offer rack scale liquid cooling, which is where every compute node in the rack is liquid cooled with cold plate. Uh, it offers greater density than, than perhaps the workstation, uh, but it's not closed loop, so it's not self-contained within the unit. It relies on uh, facility cooling, either in the form of uh, chiller doors or uh, chillers on the roof of the, uh, the building to provide cool liquid. Uh, to to the, our CDU that resides in the bottom of the rack, uh, but the the CDU that distributes the coolant to the nodes within the rack is uh, is a proprietary design to us, um, and we have a, a lot of detail available on it. Uh, should should anyone be uh, be interested, I, I don't think we have the time to go through go through it today. Okay, and there's another question coming in. So, um, through um, liquid lifetime and if liquid um, reduce how it, how it will top up? So, the liquid is provisioned to last, you know, three, five years. Uh, it's designed to be maintenance free, uh, but the idea of putting the window in is that the end user periodically checks the liquid as part of routine maintenance. Uh, if it does require a top up, that can be done uh, with on-site service or it can be serviced back at back at base with partners such as Boston at their facility. Okay, good. Um, thank you. So I think um, there are no other questions. So I'm passing um, back to you, Sam. Oh, just um, just a, just another one. Sorry. So we need to order liquid if it's reduced, right? This is a following question. I assume uh, the the question means if the liquid is reduced in the field. Uh, no, it's, yep. it's 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 our responsibility as part of the as part of a maintenance agreement that is sold with the server or system. It's designed to be maintenance free from the end user perspective. Okay. I think unless Andreas, there are any um Further questions, that would conclude uh, today's session.
as mentioned uh, at the start, the uh, the slides will be sent as well as the recording uploaded to YouTube. The links will also be provided. Um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you all for attending. <laughs>